Um, my name is uh, Mirko Marchetti, and it will be my pleasure and my honor to be the track chair for this session that I really consider to be a very important and uh, a relevant session for the um, Italian Security Conference. So, um, before beginning with the presentation of the uh, very good technical papers that have been accepted and, and that belong to the session, I would just like to briefly introduce the, um, uh, the the main topics we are talking about. Okay, so maybe some of you, while probably being expert in cybersecurity, might not be expert in automotive cybersecurity, and so maybe a question will arise. So, is it really necessary to have a specific track for automotive cybersecurity? Well, um, actually, uh, I think that this is definitely the case. So. Um, as you probably already noticed, every motor vehicle is uh, much more than a purely physical mechanical element. It's something that is connected to the outside, uh, it's something that is connected to the internet, to devices, and it's something that is also largely controlled by software. Um, so what might happen in this situation is that, of course, everywhere when we have software, that might there might be vulnerabilities and there might be cyber attacks. And, um, so probably some of you uh, already know about uh, a seminal event in the uh, automotive cybersecurity history that is basically the, the very famous cyber attack of Miller and Balasek against the Jeep. And in this image, you just have a very, I mean, iconic representation of a Jeep that uh, attackers um, have been able to basically um, make to go out of the road. Okay, so. This was controlled environment. Of course, this kind of things could create an accident and could create also safety uh, problems in, if someone tries to do this kind of stunt um, in a crowded city, for example. Uh, this is by far the most famous uh, attack. Uh, but I would also like to stress out that it is not um, the first one. Uh, earlier attacks, very similar attacks, have been carried out even five years before, or starting from 2009 and 2010. And uh, this is not the only cyber attack. Okay? And this received a wide um, news coverage, uh, but pretty much every car brand in uh, some way or another has been subject to cyber attacks. And uh, also, while it is extremely important to work on the security for the car, and uh, in this paper, in this session, we actually are going to see a few papers that focus on cybersecurity for the car itself, we should not forget that the car is not alone. Um, the car is connected uh, to the cloud, for example, uh, in order to enable value-added services, such as, for example, fleet management, uh, or um, uh, car sharing, or uh, any other value-added service that might be provided by the car maker or by third-party companies that is accessible, for example, through the vehicle infotainment system connected to the internet. And so we do have here a computer connected to the internet, connected to the cyber physical system of the car. So we do have likely a problem. And uh, connection to the cloud is not the only connection modern vehicles have. So th they are also connected to other vehicles and to the infrastructure through vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure uh, communication protocols, um, which also means that uh, it is possible for a car to influence uh, other vehicles and uh, to communicate with the infrastructure and possibly change the landscape in which other vehicles are moving. Um, which also brings us to talk about uh, infrastructured uh, roads or also smart roads as they are uh, called and referred to. And uh, so here we do have uh, a for example, a highway or or just a road that, that includes several sensors uh, connected to several uh, devices and services for controlling uh, the road, but uh, not only roads, but also bridges and uh, um, uh, underpasses uh, have to be instrumented and uh, should allow communication between the vehicle and the infrastructure itself. And uh, these are critical infrastructure, basically, by, by definition. So. Uh, communication between the car and the infrastructure can also influence critical infrastructures in this kind of uh, complex um, complex scenario. Um, and not to forget about uh, different ways of mobility that are not uh, simple cars, uh, but that, that still leverage a 
connected infrastructures, such as, for example, um, railroad transportation or other um, uh, multimodal transportation systems um, that are part of infrastructure. Uh, roads and railways, for example, and so becomes interconnected to the internet, to the infrastructure, together with other services. So we are actually moving, um, starting from the security of a single car, uh, to a much more wide and interesting scenario in which basically we do have the complete full aspects of smart mobility uh, that we we might find out in a, in a smart city, in which. Uh, everything or smart region or smart nation in which uh, everything is interconnected and interdependent among themselves and in which um, consequences of a cyber attack against a single car or a single piece of infrastructure may actually reflect on several other um, interconnected devices and systems. So this is definitely a relevant topic and, and a very interesting topic to, uh, to research about and um, just as Last note I would like to tell you, we should not forget that uh, not only technology is evolving, but also laws and regulations are evolving. Maybe not so rapidly as, as technology does, uh, but we can definitely see that things are, are moving and changing and, and improving on that point of view. So, for example, here you just have the, uh, the title of uh, the um, UN regulation for cybersecurity of vehicles. This has already been approved. And in Europe, starting from um, July 2022, so just in a few months, um, any new uh, vehicle, any new model has to be uh, approved. And in order to be approved, they also have to endure some sort of security testing. So vulnerability assessment and penetration testing will become um, part of the um, type approval process of a new vehicle. And uh, also, we do have the uh, ISO 21434 norm, uh, which has not been approved yet. Uh, we expect this norm to be approved probably within the end of this year, 2021, and that actually regulates and, and prescribes lots of different security countermeasures OEM have to adopt, both from, from a technical point of view and from a management point of view, in order to ensure that the security of, of modern car improves over time. So. Um, the, the combined uh, push of the, the, uh, the need for, for new services together with uh, um, these regulations actually will, uh, will definitely make the, the cybersecurity landscape for smart mobility and, and, and automotive very dynamic in, in the next few years. Uh, so without further ado, I would just like to um, uh, introduce the, um, the presentation of our session. We do have five different uh, presentations in this track. And uh, the first one uh, will be a benchmark framework for CAN intrusion detection system, which will be presented by uh, Dario Stabili, who is a, a postdoc um, with a PhD entirely devoted to automotive cybersecurity topics uh, at the University of Modena in Reggio Emilia. So without further ado, I will now make Dario presenter. And please, Dario, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm just trying to get the, the video started. Okay. Okay. You can see the presentation? Can you see it? All right. Yes, we can see. Okay, so. Thank you, Mirko, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Darius Stami, I'm from the University of Madeira in Reggio Emilia, and today I will um, describe you a benchmark. I will present to you a benchmark, a benchmark framework for a CAN intrusion detection system. This is a brief outline of the presentation that I'm going to show you. We starting with the introduction and the contribution of the paper. After that, I will introduce the background knowledge required for the basic understanding. And following that, I will analyze current uh, uh, existing attacks to uh, can through a particular um, in vehicle protocol to define the threat model that we are considering in this paper. After that, uh, I will describe the intrusion detection system composing the benchmark framework that I'm presenting to you and uh, the performance evaluation of the algorithm against the same threat model will be uh, presented in the last section in the last part of the presentation and conclusion, of course, will follow. So 
Uh, like Mirko said, there are many functionalities that today are deployed on modern vehicles, and uh, vehicle can be seen as a cyber physical system in which we have a cyber car that is composed by these electronic components that are interconnected with each other by means of different communication protocols, such as the controller network, the most media oriented system transport, or the local interconnect network. These are all uh, communication protocols that have been that have been designed for this particular uh, scenario of application and that are, of course, uh, applied to other scenarios. And uh, the physical part, of course, is represented by the mechanical vehicle itself. So it is uh, the, the cybersecurity for automotive field is particularly interesting because it's the first case in which a cyber attack to a target object, that is a target vehicle, uh, can have physical consequences to the people. So it's not only that attack, but I can also drive people to uh, perform some malicious actions, such as driving over a pedestrian or in a particular uh, driving, maybe not a vehicle, but uh, a tier over a uh, pedestrian zone in a particular crowded city. So uh, the, for the definition of uh, the security of the internal vehicle networks, it is necessary to identify the protocols used for the communication between these microcontrollers and also uh, the field of application of each protocol. The, this paper focuses mostly on the controller alarm network because it's the most deployed internal networking protocol and the contribution of, the pa of this paper are twice. The first one is the definition of a thread model for the controller alarm network. Uh, we, def we define the thread model by analyzing existing attacks uh, multiple, of course, attacks are identified and included in the threat model, and each attack scenario is simulated on a CAN dataset gathered from a real vehicle in real traffic conditions. So there is, there is only the simulation of the attack for security and safety reasons. And uh, of course, both dataset, uh, both clean and infected dataset, are publicly released. The second contribution is uh, the evaluation of the detection performance of four intrusion detection systems, representing four different detection features that can be used for in vehicle security. Uh, these detection performance are evaluated by means of a measure in order to have uh, an index uh, that we can uh, compare in between the different intrusion detection system, and of course we tested. Uh, build the intrusion detection system against the same attachment areas to identify the best detection method for each of these uh, detection scenarios. So the, why the controller network? Well, mostly because the controller network is, of course, the most deployed networking protocol for in vehicle network communication, and also because uh, the first published uh, standard is uh, dated 1991. So that means that the controller network is today 30 years old, and as such, uh, at, at the time it has been designed, it has uh, no uh, security guarantee included in the standard. So to prevent, to, to increase the security of the communication protocol, it is necessary to deploy the intrusion detection system to continuously monitor the communication and to identify potential threat. Uh, the controller on network is a broadcast message-based communication protocol. All the microcontroller attached to a particular CAM segment can send a message uh, where the, when they want, so when they can start the communication whenever they want, and the content of the message, all the messages are read by all the other microcontrollers. And uh, of course, the microcontroller only uses the content of the message that is required for its operation. Uh, the, this content is, is nowadays used for the development uh, and the deployment of uh, drive-by-wire features, and uh, this is mostly uh, the main uh, the main motivation uh, behind the the necessity to increase the security of this particular communication protocol. Here you can see an example of a schema, actually, of a can uh, data frame. Uh, we have uh, an ID that contains the identifier that is used by the different video controllers to uh, read the message and to identify, of course, uh, if, their if this particular message is required for their functioning. And uh, the most important part of the CAN data frame is the data field that is composed by, uh, it's a variable size field composed up to 64 bits of data. And the bits are used to include the readings gathered from the sensor connected to the sender ECU. 
uh, these readings can be uh, sensor readings from for example a rotational sensor reading connected to the to the vehicle to the wheels of the vehicle or a rotational sensor and, uh, reading connected to the um, engine of the vehicle and as such it is used to uh, gather data from a particular issue to pack them together and to send uh, to the other required for their operation. For the definition of the threat model, uh, we analyzed existing attacks. Uh, the one on the left is the Miller and Balasek attack that Nioko already uh, presented you, while the other two are uh, gained uh, somehow uh, quite interesting media covers, but not as such as uh, the Miller and Balasek one. But in all these attack scenarios, the so the, the, the security researchers were able to achieve access to the internal communication protocol to the internal canvas of the vehicle and after uh, having access to the internal communication network they were able to send arbitrary messages to control the drive-by wire feature exposed on that particular segment so they were pretty much able to uh, drive the vehicle remotely uh, these attacks all have uh, a common attack pattern that is the CAN message injection, of course, because after obtaining remote access, they started injecting messages on the network. And this is the first attack that is considered in our threat model. Uh, from the analysis, from the detailed analysis of the, of the different attack scenarios, we identified also the fuzzing attack used for, uh, as a preliminary step in all the uh, aforementioned uh, attacks and is generally associated with the reverse engineering of the content on the data frame to uh, identify the relevant signals uh, that, that can be used for uh, driving a vehicle by sending messages. And of course, there is another attack that is a disruption attack identified as a preliminary step for another attack scenario that uh, has only been uh, described and presented in literature. In this attack scenario called the WhatsApp attack, the, the idea is that the attacker is able to send an ECU in a bus stop state, meaning that the ECU does not participate in the account communication, and so they can replace the messages that would be uh, normally sent by the ECU by sending uh, custom messages. So uh, the threat model that I'm considering today for the presentation of the benchmark framework is composed by, by two different replay attack scenarios. One is the valid sequence replay attack and one is the invalid sequence replay. Um, both attack scenarios are uh, simulated by injecting a sequence of messages. In the first one, the sequence of messages are valid sequence. That means that we replayed a sequence gathered from the uh, clean data set at a later time. While in the second attack scenario, we created uh, sequences composed, we randomly created sequences by using valid message IDs. In this attack scenario, we wanted to uh, represent a different approach of the attacker for the replay uh, of messages. The second attack scenario is the fuzzing attack in which we injected a malformed value of the payload fuzzing of the payload, sorry, to uh, we mimic the, the behavior of uh, the, the early stages of rever reverse engineering of the content of the messages. And the last attack scenario is a disruption attack in which we aimed to disrupt the normal can communication and we simulated the ECU inhibition. That is the, uh, the scenario in which the attacker is able to send a particular ECU in its bus of state to remove it from the communication. The benchmark, the benchmark framework is composed by four anomaly detection algorithms. The first one is based on the analysis of the sequence uh, of message IDs, uh, the analysis of couple, of course, of message IDs. Um, the algorithm knows all the valid, all the possible transition between the couple of message IDs, and uh, if in the detection phase is a if an, a couple of uh, transition. Uh, a couple of IDs is not found in a detection model, in a normal model, then an anomaly is detected. The second, uh, the second detection algorithm uh, is based on the information entropy of the CAN data frame evaluated over a particular time window T. Uh, the algorithm defines a valid entropy range for that particular time window, and in the detection phase, if uh, the entropy evaluated on the CAN communication is outside of the valid range, then an anomaly is detected. 
the admin distance works pretty much in the same way by not using uh, not using the um, the the entropy by using or by using the handling distance on the content on the payload of the messages. The algorithm defines uh, a valid range, of course, and if a uh, damning distance between consecutive messages is not uh, inside the valid range, then an anomaly is raised. And in the messaging message, uh, we have an algorithm that is able to identify messages that have not been seen on the network uh, in uh, for a particular amount of time. So the new is telling me that I'm going to be too long. So these are the results. I will focus mostly on a particular on three particular scenarios in the replay attack. You can see as a general that the ID sequence is able to detect the, the, the anomalies consistently against the random sequence replay, while in the valid sequence replay it has a decreasing um, detection performance, meaning that the longer the injected sequence, as you can see on the X axis, the lower the detection performance that are displayed on the Y axis using the F measure. Overall, we can see also that the entropy detection algorithm is able to achieve pretty much all the same results against all the detection areas, but these are poor detection results. Against the fuzzing attack, you can see here we have that the amming detection algorithm is able to detect uh, consistently uh, some, uh, some anomalies, but again, uh, the, the mean detection, uh, the mean value of the ID sequence uh, detection attack is pretty much higher. Uh, it depends on the scenario, of course. And against the disruption attack, we have that the missing message algorithm that has also been designed for this particular detection area is, uh, uh, of course, the one that is able to achieve better detection results. I'm sorry if I've been uh, too long. So the, to summarize the, uh, the findings of the paper, we have that the message sequence algorithm is the only detection algorithm that is supported by to achieve detection results against all the affection areas. We have the ending distance and the, ending, uh, the missing message algorithm that are only affected about against a single affection areas, while also the bus entropy detection is effective only against high volume, uh, the attack scenario composing a high volume injection or removal of messages. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Dario, for your presentation. Um, we do have just time for, for a very quick answer uh, with, with a very quick question. Uh, so, um, could you uh, just tell us something about, do you have an intuition about why message sequence algorithms are actually able to achieve, let's say, consistent performance against uh, a wide range of attacks? Okay, yeah, well, uh, after the, the, the results, we started to identify the, the, the reason uh, because uh, behind the, the the behavior of the detection algorithm, and we find out also we found out that uh, the miss the message sequence algorithm is um, able to achieve overall higher detection results against all the other detection areas, mostly because is only uh, focusing on a particular field that is a uh, field of the CAN data frame that is used to uh, simulate all the detection areas. I mean, since the, all the attention areas are either by injecting, so to increase the number of messages and to uh, change the sequence of the normal messages or to remove message, messages from the normal sequence, it is clear that by analyzing the message, um, it is easier to detect anomalies. This is also true for the bus entropy detection algorithm because, of course, increasing the load of the bus or decreasing the number of messages also affects the uh, the entropy, but uh, for the detection performance of the bus entropy algorithm to be consistent, we need high volume attacks. So it is not possible to change significantly the um, the entropy of a particular time window by injecting a single message or ten messages. Uh, it is possible by injecting hundreds of messages. That is another form of attack. We need not consider because it's too naive. But uh, it also, uh, yeah, that pretty much is the, the case. By injecting a single message, you change the sequence of the normal messages, uh, and you cannot change consistently uh, all the other uh, detection, ma detect detection measures. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you.
Uh, okay, so it's time for uh, the next paper. I ask uh, uh, Dario if you can make uh, Massimiliano Masi presenter. Uh, so the next uh, paper I, will. I cannot. Okay, here it is. The next paper will have the title, The Systematic Approach for the Definition of Control Measures in Industrial IoT and Automotive Case, and I find the paper very interesting since it tackles the cybersecurity pro problem, not only from a technical point of view, but also from a methodological one. So um, this is a very nice contribution to this, to this track. The paper will be presented by um, Massimiliano Masi, who has been working in enterprise architecture with a special focus on security in healthcare, energy, and automotive fields. And uh, recently, he joined uh, Autostrad per l'Italia, where he is responsible for the security of cooperative intelligent transport systems for about 3,000 kilometers of motorway under concession. So, please, um, Massimiliano, the floor Thank is you. Uh, um, but if I click share, my screen is great, so I cannot share my screen somehow. Okay, maybe Francesca, can you help us? Pro probably I need some more permissions. You have the permission, so probably you have a problem with uh, the settings. I'm checking it. Okay, I think I need to uh, to rejoin. Uh, okay, so um, let us wait just a minute for Massimiliano to rejoin. In case this doesn't happen very fast, we might skip the next presentation and uh, recover Massimiliano's one after. back but I think you need to give me back the permissions now and now you can see my screen wonderful okay Massimiliano the floor is yours okay sorry for that thank you very much so I'm here, uh, I will introduce you our methodology that has been jointly made together with Tania Pavleska and Simone Pezzoli, and that we actually uh, developed um, within the years for the industrial IoT. And here we try to apply it to, to um, actually to the automotive use case. Uh, specifically, as Mirko mentioned before, uh, we applied to, to the CITS actually. So, very shortly, what, what are CATS? Uh, CATS means is an acronym for Cooperative Intelligent Transport System, and basically, those are sorry, those um, are a, a basically um, a subset of the intelligent transport system which requires cooperation between car manufacturers, motorway operators, smart cities, and public transportation. And the idea is, is to share messages between those stakeholders in order to facilitate many things like traffic control or emergency situation and platooning of vehicles there are many use cases and the idea is to actually to improve the sustainability and safety of the of the trips and the and the multimodal transportation somehow they are well somehow well regulated because the, as, as i mentioned there are several use cases some of them applying security and safety so uh, typically a CITS message in the case of a motorway operator is um, uh, it starts from um, sending information about roadworks warning 
in the in the motorway or up to platooning of trucks and basically including safety so um if uh if, uh, if um a truck has a um, or a vehicle as a, something to signal like a, an emergency break in a specific lane, then this message includes safety information. So those messages has to be uh, somehow secure. And but the way how those messages are secured actually involves, um, since we speak about cooperative systems, it's actually involving a lot of um, uh, different way uh, different protection of rings and different security zones so the uh, the, uh, the attack surface is actually very complex because imagine uh, in the example of roadworks warning that i was doing before so the message is traveling from uh is sent for instance by uh, an operator on the street is traveling some traffic control center from an operator that is established is, that is sent then forwarded to another uh, road operator and then uh, sent over there to the to the uh, to the vehicles so this is actually uh, a complex scenario because when we have um, roadworks warning or ev everything that is uh, not under the security defined of a data center so when the message is created on the uh, on the edge actually uh, it is usually well regulated by uh, specific ISO norms like 62443, or the data center is usually, is usually protected using 27001 and so on. The specific uh, V2E, that means infrastructure to vehicle messaging, is well regulated by another domain. And in Europe, for instance, this is uh, regulated by Etsy. Uh, with a specific, with a, a set of specific uh, technical standard, indicating how those messages are secured. What secured means is that they are actually uh, uh, signed and uh, authentic. Uh, the the authentic, uh, authentication and integrity part of those messages is, are actually defined by this standard, and this actually creates a lot of confusion because uh, in, is, the cooperation between all the stakeholders. In, the, in yes, for example, a car manufacturer or a motorway operator or a smart city required to establish trust in order to flow and to bring the information to the user. Okay, so uh, for instance, a car manufacturer has to trust the information coming from the road, road operator that there is a um, some roadworks ahead. So, although uh, there are several norms, okay, as we see in this picture, that uh, are highly regulating the system. There is no way uh, to define the to to share uh, the information between uh, the, the security posture actually between two different stakeholders of the CITS platform, and uh, and how to um, yeah, and, and actually how to technically establish to establish trust. So. Uh, the European Commission is uh, fostering this approach and defined some doc uh, some regulation, documentation, and norms per se, in order to to, uh, to facilitate the the trust establishment. And this is actually uh, defining only this small part here, the uh, small part of the definition, the Etsy norm. All the other things are left unspecified. So how can uh, multiple stakeholders and here we speak about uh, hundreds of stakeholders that needs to that they need to to share um, the security posture how do they um, can uh, can share this information in a rigorous and methodological way so actually what we propose here is to a systematic approach which is level which is coming from other uh, a domain actually, so which we borrow away from other domains, like for instance the smart grid on the healthcare system uh, in Europe and worldwide, which is using enterprise architecture. So the goal is to find um, a methodology that is able to uh, categorize each asset defined in somehow in this picture, which speak, we speak about dozen uh, different assets with different security with a different security posture, and to elicit automatically the countermeasures and then to find a way to share and we we'll share these countermeasures while keeping the confidentiality of those information 
and amongst the stakeholders of the CATS platform. And we do it using the cybersecurity framework, but let's go step by step. So here, basically, we uh, adopted um, an enterprise architecture model coming from uh, Industry 4.0, Industrial IoT, which is RAMI, Reference Architecture Model for Industry 4.0. So basically here, in this, uh, in this cube, we, um, we exploit the way how RAMI creates architectural views. And we exploit it bottom up in order to categorize each asset for each communication method or standard of which specific information is shared. Uh, we categorize it and we elicit based on that the, the security information for, it, for the entire life cycle of each single asset. Because for instance, a roadside unit uh, as a different life cycle rather than a um, IT server, a typical uh, server which is used in a control center, for instance, because a roadside unit has a specific hardware security module. So the life cycle of the even of the information is different from uh, safety uh, related information or just information because of that you can see in the um, uh, basically in the uh, within the road. So in order to to grab all the aspects of the um, of the life cycle of each system, we, we adopted RMIAS, uh, which is um, a methodology uh, highly inspired by the uh, 27001 ISO definition. Uh, and the acronym is, is stands for Reference Model for Information Assurance and Security. So basic, and it is being introduced firstly for the um, within the concept of enterprise architecture in by the ESENCEF building uh, project, which is, was, been, was a project, a past project of four years ago, uh, devoted to the creation of uh, an enterprise architecture for the um, uh, public um, system in Europe. So basically here, it's easy. So we identified each asset in RAMI. So we exploited RAMI for uh, defining, uh, the, for, for categorizing the assets. And then for each for each asset and for each step of its security life cycle, we categorize what to protect. So we, we create an item in the uh, attacks only, and then performing the risk analysis and talking with the business expert, we uh, prioritize high level security goals. Like uh, we speak about confidentiality and availability. So we don't, we don't let the, the persons uh, which are devoted to uh, the um, actually to the business to uh, to talk about um, specific security countermeasure like encryption algorithm, the, which are led to the security architect. And based on that, those uh, countermeasures defined by the security architect are then mapped to the cybersecurity framework, which is our target for sharing the the posture, because the uh, the cybersecurity framework has a specific um, mean to share and to, to share the, the, the cybersecurity frame, the requirements within stakeholders. So basically, by mapping all the requirements elicited systematically by using the methodology, we already cover some of the uh, categories and subcategories of the cybersecurity framework because this is actually what they require, a systematic approach and a risk analysis based. Uh, uh, risk analysis based selection of countermeasures. And then by doing that, we actually mark uh, all the things that we, all the countermeasures that we found to, to specific um, specific subcategories. And then this is actually the cybersecurity posture that we use, that we uh, ready to be, to be shared with other stakeholders. So we don't go in the deep details of each, uh, process or countermeasure, but we highlight, we define, we share the posture, the high level posture based on subcategories of the framework automatically elicited by using the methodology. But that's not all, because after that, we have, we, the, w w what is the benefit of using RAMI and Remyers and the NIST framework is that allows us to create a digital twin of the reference architecture here, because the way how, uh, we tackle the uh, vehicle to infrastructure communication based on the norm 62443 defined uh, allows us to define the, the concept of security or reference architecture. So what is um, the, the architecture devoted to, um, to, to deliver the service? So the building blocks and the security countermeasures that we have 
allows us to define this uh, this digital twin and allows us to define what the simulation over the uh, the, the threats that we identify because uh, our threat our attacker is a typical dolly fia attacker which is omnipotent and by doing that uh, the, uh, the digital twin allows us to do very much cost effective analysis directly on abstract abstract architectural issues uh, assets sorry before sharing and implementing that in uh, in, in in actually in the street so <clears throat> also uh, this allows the testing of business continuity plans and disaster recovery for the IT part because then everything is tested and simulated in this digital twin of the of the reference architecture and basically that's all so uh, what here we provide what i briefly introduced is a, a methodology which is repeatable and measurable to to actually to share the information and the security posture between the CATS stakeholders. And then, um, which is basically uh, obtained by um, co cooperating the, the several uh, already existing best practices. And But here we concentrated on RAMI because this is uh, the, was the final for the industrial IoT. Okay, so the we were speaking about RSUs, but that's not not the only thing that is um, part of um, of, a, of a CATS platform. There are many other things like sensors on on the street uh, or red lights and so on. And these they have specific uh, they may have specific architectural reference model like the ISO IoT reference architecture. So we will continue studying and ad adapting this methodology being parametric to the architecture themselves. Okay, thank you very much, Massimiliano, for your presentation. Um, I just have one, uh, one quick question. Um, in case um, you wanted to, to actually apply this methodology to, to current projects or to projects in the very near future, what would be the, the major obstacle in, in your experience that you would have to overcome in order to actually apply this uh, this project in, in this framework in reality? Yeah, definitely the um, talking to the business expert. So because the the business expert tends to not to reason over high level security goal, but they tend to to think a bit about countermeasure. For instance, they don't in, uh, typically how to create a secure channel. They, they start thinking about HTTPS rather than thinking about confidentiality. And so this uh, and this actually is hindering somehow the the evaluation, the simulation of the of the methodology of the digital twin because um is actually what it is made for uh, in b2x there are specific um let's say performance requirements like for instance the the frequency of the messages shared by vehicles and that goes to infrastructure a cooperative awareness message is sent by each vehicle is at uh, the frequencies of 10 hertz which is a lot for it for vehicles in the, in the infrastructure mm -hmm. so somehow uh, having them uh, concentrated directly on the on the specific countermeasure, uh, actually mask them for the with the real benefits of the of the simulation and evaluating different count possible countermeasures. The cost effective analysis defined by Remias um, to given by the simulation. Okay. And we also have a question for the audience. We are almost out of time, so I ask you to, to be, I mean, as, as short as possible in your answer. So uh, the, the question is, can you give some detail of criticality or opportunities arising during the mapping between RAMI and cybersecurity framework and whether you're working on specific applications in studies for this methodology? So the, the mapping from the RAMI to the cybersecurity framework, it was straightforward because the uh, Ramier and Erimayas. The the mapping phase is easy because the because how the framework and Rami the and Remias are made. So the ref, the um, informative reference of the framework and Rami and Remias they are mostly the same. ISO twenty seven thousand one and six two four four three. And then the second question, second part. I think I got I lost it. 
Are you working on specific use cases uh, and applications for this methodology right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are we are working on specific use cases. Uh, use case the the smart road and the smart road there will be a um, a pilot which will start in the next month uh, within the yeah in some trenches of the hair motorway. Okay, wonderful. Thank you again for your presentation. Um, so we can now go to the next paper. Uh, the title of this paper is Experimental Assessment of Attribute-Based Encryption for Secure Over-the-Air Update of Software in Automotive Embedded Platform. And it will be presented by uh, Michele uh, Lamanna. Uh, Hello, I everyone. Ask Michele, if you can make Michele presenter. Uh, hi, Michele. Michele has a master's degree in Embedded Computing Systems and currently he's pursuing his PhD in the Smart Computing PhD program. Um, he has a research background uh, grounded on uh, applied encryption and more specifically in attribute-based encryption. So, uh, Ms. Michele, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mirko. I'll try to be as brief as possible. As you can uh, imagine by the title and by this presented in slide, uh, this work was actually made in part of the project, uh, which is the European Processor Initiative, uh, which aims to um, produce a European processor that then it will be um, competitive, hopefully, <laughs> in the market. So this work aims to assess the impact of an asymmetric encryption scheme like ABE, uh, and in the same time, act as a, maybe a nice demo applications to show off the potentiality of the new uh, processor at the end of the project. So this is a brief skeleton of my presentation. I will give you motivation to pursue this uh, research. Then I will give you a quick introduction about attribute-based encryption in case uh, you don't use this uh, scheme. Then we, I will introduce the uh, use case scenario in which we run our experiment, show, of course, the results of such an experiment, and then um, give you some hints in which uh, our research is going next. So motivation, uh, as clearly stated in Mirko, by Mirko in his presentation and the other presenters, um, over the updates are the future of the vehicle updates because uh, the number of ECUs inside each vehicle is in constant increase. And clearly, each ECU must be maintained by uh, each software must be maintained. So there, there is a never increasing need of updates of software of firmware. And uh, traditionally, uh, like maybe up to 10 years ago, if there was a critical issue inside one of the ECU, uh, vehicles must have been decided, and nowadays actually it happens uh, also. However, uh, over the air updates are a thing now, unfortunately, but uh, as mentioned also in the previous talk, they are mostly uh, authenticated and confidential, and rightfully so. It is very uh, critical if an attacker uh, may force a vehicle to install a malicious software. Uh, however, uh, I want to point out in this talk the uh, need of confidential updates because uh, the development of patches or maybe also new features, think about infotainment, for example, and new solutions is an intellectual property that must uh, be protected uh, because uh, rival companies can leverage your work. Not only this, but uh, uh, an attacker can also uh, acquire the source code of your update and perform a white box attack uh, on, on your patch and maybe discover a new attack or a new vulnerability. Okay, let's use a channel then. They're not mm, particularly effective because um, since the vehicles are uh, clearly uh, all over the world and a company hopefully has a great market, the distribution of the updates must be very capillary and uh, you need to reach uh, all the globe. So the choice uh, is, you can make two choices. 
one, you as the company, uh, set up your own distribution infrastructure, and that is very costly. Otherwise, you can um, use third-party servers uh, that you does not, do not control. And in that case, your update is at rest. We say it is at rest. What does it mean? It means that uh, it's not uh, protected by, let's say, TLS, because it is resting inside the database. So if a breach happens, if the third party server itself uh, wants to spy your um, update, um, it can very well do so. So clearly the encryption is the solution. Uh, however, um, does this cost really justify, uh, th does this benefit really justify this cost? So this is what this talk will be about. Uh, Ciphertext policy attribute-based encryption uh, is this uh, one solution very effective to this problem because uh, uh, it is an asymmetric and key encryption scheme that, is al that allows also to enforce access policy inside the, uh, inside the ciphertext. So this access policy basically uh, describes uh, what attributes, what characteristics uh, a vehicle must have in order to decrypt uh, the ciphertext containing the update. How can we build a policy? Well, uh, it's very simple. So let's think in the automotive world, you write a software update or a firmware update for a specific ECU model, or maybe in another case, for a specific ECU model inside a specific model of the car. So basically you are saying that this particular update must be installed on uh, vehicles that satisfy this access policy. Okay, you encrypt the message by virtue of uh, uh, elliptic cryptography and pairing based cryptography uh, and create the ciphertext. So we have a ciphertext. Let's now see an example of a key. What is a key? Uh, a key is basically a list of attributes of characteristics that describe the car in uh, car itself. So we here have two different cars, very, two very different cars, different model, different tissue inside of them. So let's imagine uh, that uh, there exists an update uh, with, that must uh, have been installed by both of these cars. Okay? Encrypting it end-to-end uh, -end, uh, with, let's say, RSA will mean uh, encrypt the same update twice, once for the key of the blue car and once for the key of the green car. However, with attribute-based encryption, you can encrypt the same update only once, and you can see that the key of the blue car and the key of the green car both actually satisfy the policy protecting the update, and then with the same uh, encrypted Date, you can deliver in a confidential fashion the update without the risk of um, reverse engineering or white box attacking on your update, even if your data at rest has been breached or has been, uh, has been given to an adversary. So this is the uh, scenario that we uh, depicted. The OEM sorry, uh, the OEM produces three different uh, ciphertexts, okay? And they uh, give them to the third-party server. They store it on third-party servers. From there, uh, vehicles all around the world can acquire the um, update, the encrypted update from home, from a workshop, from a licensed workshop, of course, there is still this possibility, maybe for all the people that uh, don't know um, how to um, face, interact with technology, or even on unsecure uh, Wi-Fi network, right? for example, in parking lots or um, anywhere inside a very highly connected uh, metropolis, for example. So uh, what did we test? First of all, how much bandwidth consumes attribute-based encryption? 
we uh, tested, um, we measured the impact in terms of bytes uh, confronted, um, compared to the uh, impact that a small software update uh, is. So we can see that, I don't know if you can see, but this is a logarithmic graph. So uh, the, we can see that the overhead in terms of size introduced by uh, this encryption scheme is uh, very negligible because it's a three order of magnitude lower than uh, your, not even average, uh, your low end uh, size of your software update. Then we measured uh, inside the vehicle, uh, how much time does the, uh, your standard ECU that you have probably on board, uh, how much time does it take uh, more than just simply uh, granting authentication of the update, uh, granting also confidentiality of your uh, update package, uh, your vehicle uh, takes. No? So um, we tested the science on an automotive uh, uh, compliant uh, evaluation board, which, which is the Xilinx uh, ZinQ Ultrascale plus MPSoft ZCU uh, 102. The mouthful, uh, and we do this in order to have um, a realistic hold on how this can impact our uh, solution, uh, and it can also uh, double that a nice comparison when once the EPI the European processor came out and can implement this demo also on it. So you can see on the right side. Uh, three scenarios. What are these scenarios? So the black scenario, uh, the scenario one, is the time that the processor takes from the request to the beginning of the installation of uh, the update package by performing only the verification of the digital signature. Uh, the scenario two is uh, the same as scenario one, but on top of that, uh, there is also the evaluation of the time that uh, the, the vehicle needs, the ECU needs uh, to decrypt uh, the update uh, with the uh, ABE scheme. So uh, if you look up to the AUTOSAR standard, uh, those uh, operations have to be performed by the so-called UCM, which is the update and configuration manager. And uh, we use, again, a automotive compliant board to have a hold of what realistically um, you should expect in, in terms of performance by a standard ECU. Scenario three is a little bit more complicated because when you are introducing uh, a new um, scheme, a new cryptographic scheme, you have also to account for key management. Uh, key management uh, in this work uh, is implemented through a mechanism called the naive key revocation. It's naive because you simply throw away your decryption key and you rebuild the system um, from, bot to, from bottom to top. So you have to re-deliver all decryption keys. Uh, in scenario three, uh, these, uh, these occurs once every six uh, updates. So even if uh, uh, there is a frequency uh, is a high frequency of revoca revocation from the vehicle's point of view, not much uh, changes, okay? This, this number has only milliseconds. So compared even to uh, the installation time of the software tech package, the impact of ABE is very negligible. And uh, the point also of this uh, talk is to uh, focus on the confidentiality that can be achieved uh, with minimum cost and, um, it's considered optional nowadays, as, as far as my knowledge goes. So in conclusion, um, attribute-based encryption offers confidentiality of data at minimum cost, since it has little to no impact on the performance of a vehicle that performs an update over a year, both in terms of bandwidth and execution time. So introducing new cryptographic schemes introduces also the problem of key management. So we have, uh, we have tested a very basic key revocation uh, mechanism. There are many in the literature advanced uh, schemes uh, that uh, address this problem. And these, of course, uh, will be 
a direction in which we will go in the future. A uh, last nice thing to consider is that vehicles have a very long lifetime and we need to uh, start to think about post-quantum resistance. Uh, there are a lot of AVE, well, not a lot of, but there are some AVE schemes based on lattices, which are uh, widely considered post-quantum resistant, and though not be proven yet on the hard. And uh, we are keeping an eye on the NIST contest for the digital signature. In particular, we are investigating currently um, the lithium crystals, the lithium digital signature uh, algorithm uh, to maybe um, substitute uh, modern uh, digital signature algorithm verifications. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Do you have any questions? I, I hope I was in time. Okay, so thank you, uh, Michele, for your nice presentation. We do have time for a very short question with, again, a very short transfer afterwards. So, um, what are the, the main differences in terms of uh, cybersecurity guarantees of your approach uh, with respect to known frameworks for over the updates, such as, for example, the Uptain framework? Can they be integrated? Do you have some uh, something to, to, to discuss? Well, on that? Um... If I, thank you for the question, it's very interesting because uh, um, Uptain actually is a well-established framework that uh, already contains an option for asymmetric encryption. If uh, I, I, were, I read the standard uh, last year, uh, but th that's the point, it's optional. And uh, it lets you choose the um, encryption scheme. So uh, I think that AVE can be easily integrated and work in pair with Uptain uh, if you implement your framework and your vehicle to work with uh, AVE. So yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's absolutely true. You can uh, integrate those two, those two elements. Again, I want just to, uh, if there is one thing that I want the um, people to take about my talk is that uh, is needed the confidentiality about the update over the air. And it's not anymore, I think, it, has not be, it must not be considered only as an optional feature, the confidentiality of the update. Yes, I perfectly agree. Okay, thank you again, Michele. Thank you uh, very much for your time. To the, to the next presentation, and the paper is entitled um, uh, learning based intrusion protection system for onboard vehicle communication, and it will be presented by Tobia Fiorese and also uh, Pietro uh, Montillo. Um, may I ask if Pietro is uh, ready, Tobia? Hi, Mirko, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Maybe the volume is a little bit low. I don't know if you can do something to improve it. I mean, myself, yeah. Mirko? Uh, yes. I don't know if you can increase the volume of your microphone somehow. Oh, well, let me check. Uh... Well, if you cannot, I guess it's still clear enough, so. Mm. Yeah, you can start, but maybe now you hear me a little bit better. Yeah, maybe yes, okay. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, yeah. okay, thank you, Mirko. And um, I'm Tobia, and today with Pietro, we are presenting our research on the development of uh, a learning-based intrusion detection system for onboard vehicle communication. And uh, I immediately leave the floor to Pietro, who will introduce to you the context of our work. Thank you, thank you, Tobia. So I am uh, uh, Pietro and I'm a senior head at the uh, uh, Blue In, and I'm also the head of the machine learning department, uh, where we focus on uh, developing machine learning. Our microcontrollers. So, uh, okay, let's start uh, with the presentation. And actually, here 
uh, we see a canvas network, a uh, network representation. So the canvas is a uh, uh, node, fact of standard for systems. Canvas connects uh, hundreds of uh, uh, devices and controls most of the electro electromechanical uh, uh, AC lights from airbags to transmission. Many forms of external interfaces were added to modern vehicles in uh, to enable uh, communication and enable a, a broad spectrum of comfort for, for drivers, but at the same time exposing the vehicle internal networks to remote attacks and increasing the vehicle cyber vulnerability. In the future, each car will constantly communicate uh, with the surrounding environment made of other cars, um, pedestrians, uh, uh, signs, sensors, giving rise to what is called the vehicle to uh, everything uh, paradigm. But being designed in the 80s, the canvas does not embed security uh, and encryption. So if we move to the next slide, uh, we can see um, some of the usual attacks that are carried out uh, over uh, some network systems. For instance, there's the denial of service attack when someone tries to inject high priority message messages in a very short time window. Or fuzzy attacks when someone is trying to inject messages of randomly spoofed CAN ID. Uh, or the impersonation attack where, where someone is trying to stop uh, uh, message transmission and is uh, replacing a target node with a, with a, with a different. Here in the picture, we can see an example of a denial of service attack where high priority messages with ID zero are sent over the network in a very, very short uh, uh, time. So two kind of approaches might be uh, followed in order to prevent and to ensure safety standards. And one is to modify the, the actual protocol authentication and encryption methods. One other instead is to build and design intrusion detection systems on top of uh, uh, So in the past years, uh, uh, statistical based methods uh, design detect the validity of uh, um, message frames with formal rules or to check uh, statistical metrics uh, of messages frames. Uh, and in more recent years, uh, learning-based methods were trying to, uh, to reach higher performances by using LSTM cell networks uh, to check uh, for anomalies, stream of uh, uh, payload values, or using compound support vector machines what we present now, what we uh, studied and what we developed, is a different method, a different approach. That is combining uh, well, a supervised learning technique with uh, generative adversarial training technique. So here we see uh, the overall scheme and the layout of the system, of the intrusion detection system that we propose, that is made of two uh, detector or two discriminator for them. The first one is trained with supervised learning techniques um, using data sets uh, um, holding uh, the usual kind of attacks uh, that we were mentioning earlier. While the second discriminator is trained with, in a supervised manner in the gener generative adversarial training technique only on a data set made and composed of, of attack data. Uh, this is uh, the key of the solution uh, because usually uh, learning-based methods not reach uh, high performances due to the lack uh, of available data set. So this solution is trying to overcome these uh, Okay, Tobia, I think you can go on with the presentation now. 
Okay, thank you, Peter. So now that we have a basic understanding of uh, our solution, we can dive more in the details of, uh, of the system. And we can start from the inputs of the two models trained. And they are matrices, and they are obtained in two ways from uh, um, the row hexadecimal frame IDs that are locked, uh, logged um, directly from the, the CAN bus. Uh, the first way consists in the simplest uh, binary encoding, while the second is the one not vector encoding of each ID. That is, uh, each digit in, uh, in the ID is uh, transformed in a vector of uh, 16 zeros with a one that in, inserted in the position corresponding to the digit. And for the first part of the, of the system, we tested uh, four network architectures that um, includes uh, convolutional and recurrent networks. And we managed also to use the data fusion technique. And we are using so two different kinds of data that are the matrices of ID and, the, and a vector of arrival times of uh, frames that are the inputs of two uh, distinct networks, which uh, last layers are combined in order to obtain a single output. And we tested uh, all these, uh, these architectures with uh, a varying buffer size. For the second part, this step uh, that uh, makes use of the generative adversarial training we are using a convolutional generator that um, with times learn to generate uh, samples that are uh, um, similar to um, real data and a simple deep neural network discriminator that with times uh, instead learns uh, to discriminate among uh, real and fake data. We tested this, uh, this architecture with three setups. Um, one is the DC gun that make use of uh, minimax loss. And the other two are based on uh, uh, Wasserstein gun that uh, make use of uh, Wasserstein loss. And in the last one, uh, we added a gradient penalty factor to stabilize uh, more the, the training. And so turning to the results, uh, we can see that um, focusing only on the supervised part of the network, the, as expected, the average accuracy is increasing with the, the size of the buffer. But also it is worth to notice that uh, the encoding plays a role in the classification performances, as uh, for uh, convolutional networks, uh, the one not vector seems uh, more accurate than the binary one. And finally, uh, the data fusion techniques um, allows us to reach a very high performance in, in terms of accuracy in, uh, in, uh, in classification of known attacks. Instead, uh, focusing only on the second part of the network, um, we can see that although in this part of the training, the network has never seen an attack, but only data that uh, comes from a normal situation. At the end of the training, in the best case, uh, we are able to um, correctly classify two out of three attacks. And of course, um, it is worth to notice here that uh, the DC gun uh, fail to reach an acceptable result, uh, and this probably is because uh, using minimax loss uh, tends to make the gun training more unstable, and so it is more difficult to reach a convergence. And finally, uh, we can say that uh, using uh, the combination of supervised and unsupervised leads to a robust classification. Uh, here we can see that uh, taking as uh, the first part of our architecture one of our weakest model that has a high false positive rate, in this case uh, 
10% of, uh, of the normal situation are misclassified as attacks. Um, in combination with the GAN, um, we can mitigate this problem. And so uh, we, at the end, have a pretty robust classific classificator. So to conclude, we can summarize that uh, uh, even using low complexity models, since uh, uh, during this work uh, we keep in mind the possibility to deploy these models in uh, constrained hardware inside a car, uh, we can reach a state of the art performance in the classification of non attacks. Also, the results obtained on uh, the GAN training are encouraging since uh, it is difficult uh, to find um, find the label data and uh, without uh, using these and only relying on normal situations and uh, real condition driving data we managed to get uh, some kind of security and also at the end we can say that the combination of supervised and unsupervised learning techniques uh, is uh, beneficial and can overcome the weaknesses of data set or models. So with this, uh, I've ended the presentation. Thank you for your attention. And we are open. Thank you, Pietro. Thank you, Pietro and Tobia, for your nice presentation. Actually, I do have one, one question. I guess I asked you uh, to provide a very short answer due to our time constraints. Um, in your experience, what is the most challenging Part in, in designing and developing approaches for intrusion detection over canvas based on machine learning. So you already mentioned the problem of uh, lack of, of labeled data set. Um, is it the yes. worst problem or maybe there is something else to consider? I think this is uh, the biggest issue in, uh, in designing this kind of, uh, of systems since uh, it is uh, very, very difficult to find uh, data in the automotive field and especially when we are talking about uh, attacks. Um, yeah. Yes, I can add uh, on top of what Tobias said, uh, Mirko, is um, generally speaking for uh, embedded machine learning systems, uh, usually there is a lack of data, since uh, usually we have uh, uh, systems that are not connected to the uh, um, the data set building part uh, is uh, always uh, at the bottleneck when designing this kind of, of, of system. And so this is why, this is the reason why we focused on uh, unsupervised learning techniques. Thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you again for your presentation. And I guess uh, we can go to the last paper in session. Uh, the title of this paper is Evading Misbehavior Detection in Banat with Dynamic Tax, and uh, the paper will be presented by Francesco Policino, who is a PhD student at the University of Modern Energy Media, specializing in cybersecurity of vehicles and especially of vehicle to vehicle communication. Uh, please, Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mirko. I block in the script. Can you see? Yes, I can see it. Yes, okay. see. Hello everyone, I'm Francesco Policino, a PhD student from the University of Modena Reggio Emilia, and today I will present you a very misbehavior detection vanets with an anxious attacks. This is the outline of my presentation. I'd like to start by giving you an overview of Vanets and I will present you the main contribution of uh, this presentation. I will continue with the base knowledge required for the understanding of this work. Next, I focus on the proposed attack that was tested on a simulation framework against different detectors. So I present you the simulation setup and experimental evaluation on different scenarios. Finally, conclusion will follow. Okay, let's start with the introduction. Vanets are a particular type of mobile network. 
but at the constraint of fast topology changes due to the ion of mobility. In Binance, we know that cars and the communication can take place vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, or more generally, we can say there is a vehicle to everything communication. Vanets enable a wide range of applications to improve traffic condition and increase the safety of the roads, but some van applications interfere with the behavior of the vehicle, as it is necessary to ensure the safety of the vehicle from both external and internal attackers. In this presentation, I don't focus on external attackers because they are handled by BKI, but instead I consider an insider attacker that has acquired widely cryptographic credential to participate in the communication. Uh, this isn't an implausible scen scenario because we can think, for example, to rental or emergency vehicles that are used by many people. And this type of attacks are mitigated by misbehavior detection systems. So the contribution of this paper are the following. First, uh, first I propose a um, novel attack that exploits advanced driver assistance systems and V2X safety communications to evade modern misbehavior detection systems. In this attack, the attacker sent to the nearby vehicles some uh, maliciously forged messages in which uh, the vehicle is faking a sudden breaking, breaking with the uh, activation of the ABS. The results of the attack are, are that an attacker can create traffic jams, congestions, and possibly, possibly cause crashes. Next, we tested the attack against the detectors implemented in the F2MD framework. F2MD is a framework for misbehavior detection that includes a large set of uh, attacks and detectors. Okay, let's continue with the base knowledge. The dedicated short range communication stack is the factor standard uh, for wireless vehicular communications. The most used message for uh, vehicular communication is the basic saved message that allows the entity of the CTS to share the information required for uh, safety relevant applications. A basic safety message contains the information about the vehicle, such as the accuracy of the GPS, the position, the braking system status, and other attributes such as the length and the width of the vehicle. These information are useful to improve the safety of all the involved vehicles by enabling possible countermeasures aimed to prevent or mitigate the dangerous situation. The misbehavior detection system model uh, that we consider in uh, this presentation is divided in four steps. First, we have the local misbehavior detection that runs on every CTS entity. Uh, next, uh, when uh, after the detection, the entity can report the misbehavior to the misbehavior authority. Uh, then the misbehavior authority will investigate on the records and uh, eventually react, for example, performing a certificate revocation request to the PKI. In this table, you can see that the HMD framework that we use to test our attack performs uh, well against the common binet uh, attacks, uh, in particular against the family of the position falsification uh, attacks. Okay, now I will present you the attack. Uh, I remark that the P2X safety communication and the advanced driver assistance systems are safety first. So it means that every reaction needed to safeguard the physical safety of drivers, passengers, and pedestrians. The proposed attack is an evolution of the position falsification and eventually stop attacks with an, uh, an active attacker that is able to craft uh, arbitrarily basic safety messages. The idea behind the attack is that it's possible to exploit the safety force policy of modern advanced driver assistance systems for example, uh, when a basic safety message with the ABS flag enabled is received, uh, as a primary safety countermeasure, modern headers activated the braking system to avoid the collision with the preceding vehicle. Event of the vehicle sending the message with the ABS, with the ABS flag enabled is not actually braking. The attacker, uh, to evade the detection of the misbehavior detection systems, uh, create a false representation of the vehicle position and the rejoined force representation of the vehicle with the real one, limiting the time window during which the nearby vehicles can detect the, disc the discrepancy between the messages and the real vehicle position. Uh, this is the attack in the details. Uh, we have the start phase where the attack send legit basic safety messages corresponding to the real state of the vehicle. In the init phase, 
the attacker started to record the values of the vehicle sensors that will be useful in the next phases of the attack, in phase four and five. In the fake break phase, the, phase, the um, attack is triggered by sending to the nearby vehicle some maliciously, maliciously forked uh, basic state message in which the vehicle is faking a sudden breaking with the um, consequent activation of the ABS. The attacker updates also the other values of the basic state message, for example, the position, to be consistent with uh, the dynamic of a real breaking value. When the desired final speed of the vehicle is reached, the recovery phase is uh, triggered. In the, uh, in the recovery phase, the attacker simulates the acceleration required by the fake vehicle representation to rejoin with the position of the real vehicle using a PID controller. In this phase of the attack, require, um, this phase of the attack requires all the um, data recorded during the previous phases uh, uh, of the attacks to recreate the path traveled by the fake representation of the vehicle. Um, finally, in the rejoin phase, the fake representation of the vehicle is uh, rejoined with its real representation. As it, uh, the attacker computes the values of the basic safety message, messages, um, such as the acceleration, the speed, and the position, in order to smoothly close the gap between the fake and the real representation of the vehicle. Now I will show you the simulation setup. For the simulation, we use the HOMD framework that is based on the Vance simulator. Vance is an open source frame, customizable framework for the simulation of vehicular network communications. The Vance framework is based on Omnet++ for the network simulation and uh, on the Sumo simulator for the road traffic simulation. HMD include both uh, local and global misbehavior module, and uh, in particular, uh, these are the implemented plausibility checks that are performed by the detectors. Uh, these checks include, for example, uh, the speed, the position, uh, and uh, other control about the state of the vehicle. Now I will show you the detection results. Uh, I reported only the results with the best configuration of the actual D framework in terms of detection. Uh, so uh, we have uh, expert check that perform all the plausibility check uh, checks that we show previously using the history of the basic safety message of our vehicle. Then pass the, uh, the outcome uh, of these checks to the local detector that eventually trigger the report. As local detector, uh, I reported the threshold app and the behavioral app. With the threshold app, our node is reported if a message failed at least one of the plausibility checks. A failure is determined if the results of the checks fall below a certain threshold. The behavioral app instead is based on the severity of the misbehavior event that is deduced from the results of the basic plausibility checks. In the first column, you can see the attack probability that we set to 15, 10, and 1%. The second column refers uh, to the false positive rate and the recall rate for the expiry check, while the last two columns refers to the threshold and the behavioral app. As you can see, with a realistic probability of 1% that, that a vehicle is an attacker, the proposed attack is not detected. Um, finally, in the last, uh, in the last uh, slide, the picture compares on the y axis uh, the percentage of triggers generating false positive in the clean scenarios versus the trigger that are able to detect the ongoing attack in the malicious scenario. Uh, as you can see, the total of false positive are triggered by the speed consistency check um, in purple, while the detection of the attack is triggered totally by the proximity plausibility check uh, in green, the position plausibility check in blue, and then we have again the uh, the speed consistency check in part. So we can say that uh, the two detectors that have demonstrated higher, higher resilience to the proposed attack, despite not being able to detect it consistently, are the proximity, plausibility, and the position, plausibility checks uh, in green and blue. Okay, let's summarize briefly what we look at. That. Uh, this paper presents a novel attack to one in which a very Vehicles generates malicious vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle messages that mimic a sharp break uh, that trigger the ABS 
and propagate this incorrect information to the nearby vehicles. Uh, the methods administered to the other vehicles are carefully crafted to mimic the dynamic of a real vehicle. We experimentally tested the attack against uh, the state-of-the-art detection algorithms included in the FUMD framework, demonstrating the ability of the attack to evade detection with high probability. Future work will include the exploration of the effectiveness of dynamic V2B attacks, uh, as well as the design of novel detection approaches uh, that will be able to detect them. Okay, that's all. Thanks uh, for the, your uh, attention. Thank you, Francesco, for your presentation. And unfortunately, we are quite out of time, so we don't have time for questions. But if for anyone has any questions in the audience, we will we'll just be able to send you an email and you will be happy to answer them offline. Okay. Francesco, could you please mute the microphone since I am here on echo? Okay, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, with this presentation, we conclude our session and hope that uh, um, everyone uh, found the session interesting as, as I did. And uh, I, I invite you to uh, attend uh, the next uh, uh, ETSEC iteration, in which uh, most likely there will be uh, again uh, an automotive and smart mobility cybersecurity section. Uh, section. So, um, uh, Thanks to all the presenter and uh, uh, thanks to the audience for for, for your attention and uh, see you next year at ETSEC. Thank you, Mirko. Bye. Bye, everyone, and have a good Thank lunch. You. Bye -bye.